All right, Dr. Juliana, thanks so much for coming for uh, today's interview. I have your application here in front of me, but why don't you start by telling me a bit about yourself? Okay, first of all, thank you for calling me up for interview. Um, about myself, I'm from a city in Colombia called Manizales. It is right on the heart of the coffee Colombian production, and it's small town. A lot of outdoor activities are done there. I decided to study to go to medical school because I guess I was inspired by my by my dad. He's a doctor, and I love the work the way he worked. So I decided to pursue career in medicine, and it has been great. I love my my career. Mm. Uh, on my free time, I love to go for walks. I like to walk my my dog and spend some time with friends and family. I have pretty good relationships with my peers and my co-workers back when I was at the hospital. Uh, people describe me as a very curious and funny person, I guess. I always, I have like clear, I put clear goals in my life. So I try to pursue them the best way I, I can. And I'm, I'm a very determined person. Okay. What got you interested in uh, wanting to do residency training in the US? When I started to go into the practice at medicine school, I started to see that the patients had really bad choices for their health and for someone taking care of them. And uh, but in Colombia, there's not many resources to treat the patients. So it's really sad to see a person die because there are no resources to treat them or to help them. Or uh, the system is completely out of control so there's no good no no good follow-up of the patient so you say okay but if you see that then why don't you stay in Colombia and try to help as many people as you can but the thing is the system won't let you help you help them so what I is my mindset is to try to help them from the outside. So I know in, in the United States, there's better resources. So I can help with those resources, with my knowledge and good training, go back there and help them with, with anything they may need. So do you plan to return to Colombia after a residency? No, full time, no. But I, I would like to go back and do like some days of just helping helping them helping people helping with the diagnosis with some resources just out of out of myself I want to do that for them what got you interested about internal medicine well internal medicine is a big part of medicine as a whole so I think it's a really important specialty because for me, every patient has a part of internal medicine in, in them. So the range and the, the broad, the broadness of medicine, internal medicine is what really got me into it. I was thinking about it, but then my grandpa had a, my, had a myocardial infraction and I saw the way internists work as a team. I really like working uh, as a part of a team. So I, de I decided to pursue that. I think it's really interesting. You mentioned that the internists were taking care of your grandfather. What was it about the way they took care of him that you really appreciated? Okay, I see the respect each of the team members had for the others. And they took all the ideas and opinions in and they came up with a diagnosis. I think that having several people in one team helps 
think about helps them get to think about a lot of other diagnoses and treatments. So it at the end it is much better for the patient. So that's the, the thing that liked I liked the most about them. Did it ever cross your mind about family medicine as a career choice? Well, family medicine is really interesting, but actually I like most about internal medicine that it is most focused on adult, adult diseases and the way that a lot of internists work in, in terms of the diagnosis and in the hospital doing rounds. So I, that's what I like the most about it. Also, I think that every subspecial, subspecialty in internal medicine is really interesting. So I, I enjoyed that, yeah. What opportunities have you had to learn about the US healthcare system? Yeah, so actually I was curious about um, the, the healthcare system in the United States. So I managed to get a rotation in Advent Health in Orlando, Florida, and it was great. I loved it. I love the way the doctors treat the patient. I love the efficiency and efficacy of the, the each team to help the patient and do it in the fastest way possible. So that's what I like the most. I love that you got good resources. You don't have to stop in every step of the way to see if you are allowed to do something. And um, I think that's that's really good. So yeah, I have done that rotation and I also did a rotation, a tiller rotation in Miami. It was great. It was great watching them work together and and coming up with new diagnosis for the patient. Have you done any rotations in the last year? Uh, in the last Actually, month? the Miami rotation was last month. Yeah, last month. All right. Well, let's talk about the US healthcare system since you have some exposure. Can you tell me if there is any one area of improvement that needs to be made in the US healthcare system the thing, you know, the way the healthcare systems work in Colombia is very different. So I guess by having a lot of resources is also maybe not that good because you need to really think about uh, why are you ordering a test? Do you need that test? What are you looking for in that patient? So you have to optimize the resources. Having a lot of resources doesn't mean that you have to spend or overspend on the resources that you have. So that's one thing that I maybe would like optimize the resource using because I think it's it's obviously you will order the necessary things, but don't over order some, some tests or imaging because it will just be a waste of, of all the resources that the system has. Do you think you can do a better job optimizing all these lab orders or radiological studies because of your training in Colombia? Yes, I do think that I can do a better job with that because, as I mentioned before, in Colombia, you have to really think about ordering a test. And even if you order it, maybe you don't get it because it is too expensive. So really thinking and analyzing the patient and thinking, what diagnosis are you looking for? It's really important to order the tests later. It's not necessary to send, to order a bunch of tests that won't guide you anywhere. So, yeah. What, what do you plan to do after residency? Well, I hope to go into a subspecialty training I, I have an interest in gastroenterology, but you know, three years learning a lot of things. Maybe I changed my mind. I don't know what can happen, but I would like to pursue subspecialty and then start working some hours in clinics, some hours mm, doing procedures. Yeah, big hospital, I hope. Let's, uh, let's learn a little bit about uh, your patient interactions in your home country in Colombia or in the U.S. Do you remember any time where a patient appreciated you for something that you did? 
Yeah, the patients in Colombia are really appreciative or everything you do for them. But it comes to my mind, one time I was doing a surgery rotation um, and a patient had its his stitches for like three weeks or four and no one would get them out because there were there was no time or anything to get them out. So I told him, you know what? Come tomorrow and I'll see you in like 10 minutes. I take out the stitches and that's fine. And he said, okay, I'll come back tomorrow. So he came back and I took out his stitches and he he was he gave me like breakfast and he said that if it wasn't for me, he would have have to take them all by himself and he wouldn't have no how to do that and yeah that's what com came to, comes to my mind with that question and any patient experience where the the patient was upset at you for something that you did or didn't do well yeah it is kind of common to have those encounters but one that is, is stuck in my mind was a patient's wife that wanted me to give him more pain medication. But with the patient by background, I knew that he was only doing it. He was an addict. So I knew he wasn't in pain. He just wanted some, some more pain painkillers and um, opioid painkillers so I told her I won't give him more medication he doesn't need it he's good he looks good and he was pretty upset she was pretty upset she started yelling at me she started yelling at the nurses so we had to call security and then then was everything was fine the I talked to a patient I told him he, he didn't need any more pain medications, that he was in a schedule, that in four hours he would get the other dose. And he said, okay, that's fine. Okay, I get it. That's it. What pain medication are you talking about? Morphine. Morphine. IV morphine. Yes. Can you tell me any leadership position that you may have had, either in med school or after med school, that you can share with me? Yeah, I was in med school actually since second the second year I was a student representative from for okay so in Colombia the the med school it, it is not divided in years it is divided in semesters so for each semester there's one person that's the representative for 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 the semester that was me I was doing like I was part of the academic council, so I would talk to the, the dean and some professors each month to see how the semester was going, what anyone needed, if something was need, had been to change or something like that. You said that uh, you are the representative and would approach the staff, the faculty, if any changes needed to be made. Is, is that what you're trying to say? Yes, sir. That is. Can you give an example of any such concerns that the students had that you were able to pass on to the faculty? Sure, yeah. So back when I was like in fourth year, I think we were on a subject. I don't remember which one exactly, but I remember that half of the of the group was telling me that, I, that they were losing the subject, that they were they weren't they were failing it. So they needed some help to put the grades up. And the teacher was no, I won't help anyone. That's not right. If you lose, you lose, you fail it, you have to repeat it. But I managed to talk to him and, and tell him, look, it's a lot of a lot of students that are, are failing in the subject. And if you can help them, not give them anything, just help them, guide them and do something for them to for them to have another opportunity to improve their grades. That would be good. So yeah, he did an extra work for them. And they did an extra extra classes. So 
they could catch up a little bit. So yeah, that's where it comes to my mind. Let's talk about feedback that you may have got from your attendings. Do you remember any time you got positive feedback from an attending? Yeah, should I talk about a specific feedback? Or? Yes, exactly. Oh, okay. So back when I was in starting the, the clinical subjects in medicine, um, I remember it was my the first time I was interviewing a patient and uh, everyone in the rotation was really nervous. So, but the, the professor said, you go ahead, Juliana, you go ahead and interview him. So I went and I talked to him and I asked him all the questions and I came back. I remember my hands were shaking because I had never talked to a patient before. And, and he asked me a lot of questions. The professor asked me a lot of questions about what had I figured out from the case and all of that. And after that, he said, that's awesome. I can't believe that you have done that. It's your first, your first patient and you got out of him just the information you needed to make a diagnosis. So, yeah. And anytime you got negative feedback from an attending? Yeah. I have in, in, in a nephrology rotation, yeah, in internal medicine. Um, I remember we were in a rush because we had a lot of patients in, in the day. And I was with my, my, co my peers trying to figure out what a patient had and the patient wouldn't talk to us. And it was kind of a mess. So we came out, came out and we told the professor like, hey, the patient won't talk to us. What, like, I don't, we don't know what to do. And he said like, eh, okay, you first need to calm down. Just one of you come eh, get in there. You have to get the information. You are a doctor information. You have to do it. And you need to be, be have a better organization. You have to have better questions. You have to, talk to him he's your patient you have to do it and yeah that was I think one of them tell me what are the kind of residents you're looking forward to working with in your residency program I'm looking forward to work with a resident that likes to team to teamwork it's willing to help others in any way they they can I'm not talking just like professionally but maybe emotionally, if you can help another person or anyone actually, that, that it's good. And also that has like, maybe like love for, for teaching and can help, help you with anything that you may, may need at a certain time, so yeah. And residents whom you're gonna have a very difficult time working with, how would you describe them? Well, I think that's a tough one. Maybe I actually know, maybe someone that's selfish with their knowledge, maybe someone that's not willing to help you improve professionally. I guess, I guess that's important. Okay. We're now going to go into some situations that you may encounter during residency and see how you would respond in those, in those scenarios. Let's say you're, you're taking care of a patient in the clinic. You're seeing someone for urinary tract infections, a young woman you're seeing, and you review her chart. You, make a, you kind of see what medications she's on, review all the allergies, and you feel that, okay, she would do well with Bactrim. You prescribe her Bactrim and you find out that a few days later, she, the patient had to be in the emergency room because she had an allergic reaction. She had hives, she had a rash, but it quickly got better just with antihistaminics. Following that event, the patient sees you in the clinic and says, Dr. Pawa, you kind of almost killed me with that antibiotic. How would you respond to that? I bet that was really scary having those hives and the reaction you had, but I can assure you that I revised all your, your 
allergy history and you didn't, you didn't have any, but every time with a new medication, some reactions ha can happen. And sadly, it was the hives was one of them. And now you know, so you can inform the other doctors about your allergic reaction to Bactrim and that won't happen again. But yeah, that's a risk to assume when taking a, a, new, a new medication that you have never took before. All right, we're getting close to the end of the interview. What do you do to maintain your study life balance? Well, I really like going on walks, as I mentioned before. I love hanging out with my friends. We would go to the movies or have dinner or go dancing. Mm, I like spending time with my family. Uh, we really enjoy playing bo board games. Mm, I like to be go visit my grandmother and talking to her. It's really nice. Well, I, I, lo I love working out. I, I work out every day when I can and that that really helps me. I really like it. And reading other things besides medicine, things like I love novel, novels and science fiction. What's the last book you read? Well, I was reading Be Becoming by me. me. Any, uh, anything that really struck you or that really inspired you from that novel, from that book? Well, She's a really inspiring woman. So pretty much everything. It's really fun. It was really fun learning about her childhood and how she got into college. It, it was really, really inspiring. The whole, the whole book. Okay. Sounds good, Dr. Juliana. Any uh, questions for me before we uh, end the interview? Yeah, sure. I have a question. So yourself as an international medical graduate, how would you say it, it was adapting to residency? How was the rela relationship with your peers and all of that? So it was just like for any medical graduate coming from a different country, working in a different healthcare system and now coming to the US healthcare system, there's always a bit of a learning curve, a bit of a culture shock. And so that will happen with everyone. What really helped me was the fact that I had about four weeks of, it's, it's called an observership. So basically I was shadowing my future colleagues and residents as to how they get the work done, learn the EMR, learn how to put orders, learn how to watch how they were communicating and the noon conferences. And so that really helped me very easily transition into the residency. And that's what I like to offer to uh, international medical graduates if they have the ability to shadow their colleagues a few weeks before they start. I really feel it helps them. How do you find your way around the hospital? Where's the cafeteria? Uh, and it really gives you a very good idea of the, the work environment in the hospital. Sounds good, Dr. Juliana. All the very best to you, and thank you for coming for today's interview. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay. All right. How was it? Well, I felt really nervous. If you notice, my my accent came came out. When I get nervous, I I I got get an accent. Well, more accent. But I've never had any trouble understanding what you were saying. I mean, of course, I mean, yeah, maybe the grammar might not be like 100% correct, but it was pretty good. I, I didn't have any trouble understanding what you're trying to say. So that was okay. That's not an issue. And I, I did ask you one question, which I'll certainly discuss before we end is the USMLE Step 1 score. So we'll mm -hmm. talk about that uh, when we do the discussion. I think it went well. Seems like you're having the content in your mind. I think just with a little bit more practice, you'll be able to present it a little bit more concisely. And we just have to keep practicing a little bit more and kind of speaking it out more confidently. And uh, I think that, that will come again with practice. A few major points I'll tell you, and then we'll go through every question. When you were talking about why U.S., 
Yeah. You kind of talked a lot about how things are, I'm going to use the word pretty terrible uh, in Colombia, in uh, the, the practice of medicine. And I'm like, okay, you've kind of lived there your whole life and studied there. And so it's not a good approach that way. I mean, you can certainly talk about what are the things that you liked about the U.S. healthcare system. And instead of, hey, our patients don't know this information here in uh, Colombia, like the healthcare system is out of control. I guess instead of that, talking more about what was it that you really liked about the U.S. healthcare system, whether it is evidence-based medicine, whether it's preventive medicine, like the colon cancer screening the guidelines that are out there, or the fact that the residency curriculum, it allows you for, besides the clinical work, there, there are opportunities to learn, there are research opportunities, so that kind of a curriculum you like. So what I'm trying to say is rather than talking negative about the stuff, yeah. let's talk about the positive stuff that, that you really like. Unless they really question, no, tell, me, tell me how it works in your country and why is it uh, bad. Uh, I think we should always have a very positive, optimistic kind of attitude uh, towards this. For example, and this is a, so a question that I do ask sometimes, how do you feel your training in Colombia will help you uh, in the U.S.? Mm-hmm. If you're telling me you didn't have any resources, if you're telling me that patients didn't know much about their disease. So if that's the system you studied in, how are you going to be successful in the U.S.? And so folks will say stuff like, because it was a busy hospital, I learned how to be efficient, how to organize my work, how to prioritize my work so that I can get my work done through the day. Because resources were limited, I had to really, like you mentioned, think twice about ordering tests and uh, radiological studies. And so I'll be very well equipped to practice cost-effective medicine. That's certainly something very desirable in the U.S. So at least those few things you can say uh, if, if asked. Okay. Let me just talk about the setup a little bit. I think your camera is a little bit down and it's kind of, I think you're kind of looking down on the camera. Is that oh. right? Because I can kind of see your ceiling and everything. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. You have to like raise the laptop or the camera so that the camera lens is like horizontally at your eye level. Okay. And could you tell me where exactly were you looking to, because I don't think you were looking at the camera. You were looking maybe above the camera or something like on a wall or something. Is that right? Where I was actually looking at the camera. I don't know. <laughs> I, don't I mean, a few times you were, is it somewhere like, you were, I thought you were looking somewhere above the camera, like somewhere there, and then you would look at the camera. So it was kind of, maybe you're looking at a wall or something. I don't know. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's white wall. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, that's Okay. Because in the virtual setting, you basically have to try and look uh, as much at the camera. Or I don't know if you follow me on Twitter or the Facebook. I kind of showed how to resize the Zoom window and just bring up the whole window close to the camera. That way you can still see the interviewer and still look like you're maintaining eye contact. Okay. But if you have like my picture at the bottom, uh, and if you're looking down there somewhere at, at my picture, then... There's no eye contact. It gives a very weird feeling uh, on, on the interviewer side. So just keep that in mind. I mean, the rest of it is all fine. It's like non-distracting background. So that's all That's all good. Okay. And audio and lighting and all is perfectly fine. No problem with that. All right. Let's look at the other questions. So tell me about yourself. So you mentioned about growing up in Colombia. You mentioned something that, that there are a lot of outdoor activities in Colombia. See, when you're trying to answer, tell me about yourself, you have to tell the stuff that will show me why you're going to be a good resident physician. Mm. So telling me about there are a lot of outdoor activities in Colombia, no, I don't, that's not very helpful. If you were to say, I grew up in Colombia um, in a town where I kind of got to work and interact with people of different socioeconomic backgrounds. So it just tells me that, okay, she had a very diverse upbringing. And because that just helps you when you're taking care of patients. I mean, if you can understand what folks have gone through, I think people will understand and connect better with those patients. If you want to say that, the next uh, part that is, I was inspired to go into medicine because of my father. You said he was a doctor, but doctor of what? Okay. Okay, he's a pathologist. Okay. Pathologist. So yeah, so you can say I was inspired to go into medicine by my father, who's a pathologist. And what was it about your dad that inspired you? Was it hard work? Was it perseverance or pathology? You have to pay a lot of attention to detail. I guess something like that. 
Or if there was like another internist, you would say maybe they had good communication skills or surgeon surgical skills. So that's what I wanted to say. What about dad's work ethic was it that you liked? Maybe you can say pathologist attention to detail, I guess. And then you started talking about your med school training in Colombia. And I guess rather than focusing on the negatives, again, say the hospital attached to my med school was a busy hospital where I really got to see a wide variety of situations, both acute diseases and chronic diseases. And because of limited resources, I really learned how to practice cost-effective medicine. You can say, because that's very unique about IMGs, at least these two things. I also had leadership skills in my med school because leadership is a very key word, very important. When I was a class student representative in, in my med school and after I also had the chance to do rotations in the U.S. and that really got me very excited about wanting to do residency in the U.S. You said something, I love my career and I'm like, okay, well, I don't know why she's saying that. Mm-hmm. What, yeah. what exactly do you mean by that? Hey. I don't know. I guess like to show I okay. made a good decision. I don't know. Well, I love my career. It's like then, then kind of, okay, if you love your career in Colombia, then why are you wanting to come to the U.S.? So it's not fitting well. But you don't need, necessarily need, need to say that uh, I want to do uh, internal medicine, but just kind of you talk about your leadership, your teamwork, your communication uh, skills. Then the other parts, like you said, outside medicine, I like to go out walking what is that what does walking really mean like uh, okay so walking in, or hiking in my, <laughs> in my city there are beautiful trails because it's like oh, trails. Okay. pretty like kind of rural setting so there's it is very common to just walk on the, those trails in yeah in so it's called trail. hiking trail i think oh, that's okay. what it's called so oh. use word hiking walking is like okay i guess we all walk but mm-hmm. hiking is a little bit, that's how you connect with nature. So that's uh, good. And you said walk my dog. You can give the name of the dog if you wish. Some It just gives a good connection. Okay. And when you said my friends think, find me very curious, funny. And you said I have a very good relation with them. I'm not sure what that means. So you can say personable, which basically means that I'm able to connect with another person very easily personable or approachable those are good words so you, you tell me about yourself as one of the first uh, or second question so you could say thank you uh, dr agrawal for inviting me for the interview about myself i grew up in colombia in a in a town man- where i really got to meet and see people from a variety of socioeconomic backgrounds I was inspired to go into medicine by my father, who's a pathologist, and how he put in a lot of attention to his work. In my med school, besides doing my clinical training, I also developed leadership skills, such as when I was a student representative for my class. My med school is among the top med schools in the country, and I got to see a wide variety of clinical disorders ranging from infectious diseases uh, and all the way up to com- uh, chronic diseases. And because it was a busy hospital, I really learned the value of teamwork and clear communication between team members. I did get a chance to rotate in the U.S. and really loved how uh, the practice of evidence-based medicine in the U.S. I Outside medicine, I like to uh, go hiking on trails, uh, especially some that I've done in Colombia, and uh, spend time with my family and my dog, Sam. My friends like to think of me as someone who is very curious, funny, and very easy to connect with. With all these experiences, I'm very excited to be interviewing with you today. So this way, you've kind of, you're kind of basically highlighting the positive aspect of each part what's your drive your dad what did you do in med school what happened in the u.s who are you as a person outside medicine so you're kind of highlighting all the strong points and i think that that'll make it a much more impactful tell me about yourself and again showing enthusiasm like i'm very excited uh and so because you know this, the first impressions matter that's why we have to like really really get this part right so that's why. yeah yeah so you're getting the content it just has to be uh, repackaged uh, kind of a thing 
what, what did you like about the US? So like I told you, let's not talk about about Colombia. Let's talk about evidence-based medicine, EMR system, I guess, that allows people to get all the information. You like the curriculum. You liked that patients were very involved in their care and so forth. Because like if you have to prescribe an antihypertensive, you have to explain to them why mm-hmm. are you prescribing that rather than, okay, here's a medication, just take it kind of a thing. I asked you why internal medicine. So you mentioned the breadth of uh, internal medicine because I like that part that you said every patient has a disorder that needs to be addressed by an internist. That, that part came out nicely. You mentioned about how your grandfather had the MI. Did you, did you call it inf- infarction or infraction? I... I know it's infarction. I don't know what I said. <laughs> you said infraction because I was like, did she say that? We're going to have to go back. But anyways, mm-hmm. kind of minor thing. But uh, what got you interested was what I was trying to ask you next. What exactly did you like? Like the fact that they explained to him and you in a very easy to understand manner what was going on and what needs to be done. And this is something I like to do for my patients. So, so I, I would add that part of this, is what I want to do for my patients. Other stuff people will say is I like to use my knowledge of pathophysiology and the pharmacology into taking care of the patient. That's fine too. But I really feel something about the patient, like patient communication, patient interaction, patient education. That's all a part of internal medicine. Mm-hmm. So really feel you should definitely talk about that. I asked you, do you want to go back to Columbia? You said you don't have an, any immediate plans to return, but that you want to still give back. So you, you can say, I would like to definitely give back by doing volunteer work. There's like one person, she goes to Africa. She does this point of care ultrasound teaching. So she'll teach them how to do the point of care ultrasound or, and that kind of teaching. Or you can say, uh, I would like to host a CME, continue, continuing medical education sessions for my colleagues in Colombia. So this is some ways that you can give back to your home country, but not necessarily by going back. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And I think that, yeah, I think that, I think that's a good point because you don't want to sound like yeah, I'm going to do my three years training and then go back. So that's why um, I like the fact that you said, I'm going to stay back, but uh, I want to, I want to give back. And these are some two ways I feel I can give back. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's good enough. Why not family medicines? That came out nicely that I want to was take care it? of. Adults. I thought it was messy. <laughs> the answer. That came out nice that, that I want to take care of adult patients. And the second was, I want to expose myself to all these specialties, internal medicine subspecialties that family medicine cannot really. I mean, in a way they can, because even family medicine, they're now being hospitalists. Mm-hmm. But I truly believe that internists do a better job communicating and collaborating with like cardiologists, nephrologists. Mm-hmm. So, so that part that, yeah, I want, to, I want to work closely with the other internal medicine subspecialties. And, and you can say here and possibly consider fellowship training. So then it makes sense. This is why internal medicine interests you. And you have very good reason. You, you said... I have an inclination or an interest in GI. So that's great. You have maybe about two months of U.S. clinical experience, if I have to say. So some might feel that, why don't you have more? Or why is it so limited? And so you have to be prepared for that question. So you can say that, hey, I did my best to find the rotations. And this is what I could find in the short time. But the time that I spent here was hands-on and I really got to interact with the patients, learn about the the practice of care, ordering tests, ordering medications, um, participating in the educational conferences. So I feel that the experience that I have will help me smoothly start residency. So you basically have to just try to convince them that... I I have a question, sorry, about about why not doing more um, clinical experience in the U.S.? Mm, can I mention that I literally graduated in February 2020, so COVID started. Right. Also, I don't know if it's okay to mention that, but like clinical experience in the US is expensive. Is that okay to mention? 
Uh, it is tough. I fully agree with you on that. You can just say it was more difficult for me lately because of the COVID pandemic. And that It was being very expensive going through third parties to arrange these rotations. You can, you can say it that way. I, I think that's okay. It's not okay. too bad. Thank I mean, you. It's not like you have it's not like you have zero experience. It's just that if someone brings it up, they just want to be assured that you'll be able to quickly get into residency and, and start working. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you. Then I asked you what needs to be improved about the US healthcare system. You said there are too, too many resources. I mean, at one side you're saying I want more resources, and now you're saying there might be too many resources. So that answer kind of didn't really fit well. But you can talk about other stuff. What is one problem in the U.S. healthcare system? You can say burnout, physician burnout is a big one. You can say, even though EMR is helpful, I've read a study about how physicians spend too, too much time in the EMR, and that takes away precious time talking with a patient. So I feel that can be improved by using templates or smart phrases. It's called smart phrases, some ways to automate your work. And that might help short, save, it might help reduce the time that you spend in the EMR. You can talk about misinformation. There's so much misinformation now about like the COVID-19 vaccine. That's a health pro, that's a problem in the US healthcare system. You can talk about opioid addiction. That's also a healthcare problem. I'm trying to, to stay away from like the cost of healthcare. Because there's no one, no one can fix the cost of healthcare. No one can fix this insurance uh, system. So you can fix burnout. You can fix the EMR. You can fix opioid addiction by saying, hey, I really want the training to take care of patients with opioid addiction. You can, you can help with the COVID misinformation by providing unbiased information. It helps fix some of those problems. But you can't fix cost of care. You can't fix insurance. So I was trying to get more towards those kind of uh, answers. Okay. And then I asked you the part that you said, I really think about, I really think twice about ordering tests. So it's called cost-effective medicine. Try to use that term. I think people will immediately understand what you're trying to say, which is great. Then I asked you, what do you want to do after residency? That came out nicely, subspecialty. And then I want to work in an academic setting. No, sorry. You said you want to work in a, in a hospital you said some stuff like big hospital and all. Just say that in the long term, uh, I see myself working as a full-time clinician in a hospital, maybe a community hospital, uh, or if you have a certain preference. Okay. And it's fine. Not everyone has to be like, uh, like an academic kind of a person. So it's perfectly fine. Uh, you can be a very good clinician, and that's also very important. Mm-hmm. Okay. Patient who appreciated you. So that was nice that you removed the sutures because no one did it. However, I was thinking, could you come up with something in internal medicine? Because this is an internal medicine interview. Um, Yeah, sure. I I can think a little bit about it. Yeah. So these kind of scenarios, patient who appreciated you, patient who was upset at you, patient where you made a medical error, that's another one, not a, like a medical legal kind of a thing, but maybe you give the wrong dose to a patient, you give a less of a dose to a mm-hmm. patient, those things happen, maybe mm-hmm. you give the wrong fluid to a patient. So those are scenarios that I'm sure all of us go through. So you can talk about yeah. any of those scenarios. Uh, patient who was upset, that came out very nicely. Uh, and that is a problem. You're abs- so Remember, I was talking about opioid addiction. That's exactly what you were trying to do. I assured them that he didn't seem in pain and that we were following the protocol that the hospital has for giving opioids in patients, that kind of a thing. Leadership skill that came out very nicely that like how you brought some changes. Did you give an example as a student representative? Yeah, I did about the the students that were failing a subject. Yeah. So then they they developed new lectures or something like that. Yeah. Okay. That's good. So start more with these stories or examples, because that's what we get very curious uh, to see what happened, what really happened in your kind of work. Uh, So being a student representative, I remember the time when students were very concerned about their failing grades in a certain subject. And I took those concerns and went to my faculty and tried to explain to them why they had to make the lectures more engaging and provide study material. 
Initially, they were hesitant because of the work involved, but they agreed. And this really helped my peers improve their performance in the exam, something like that. And you can just leave it that way. Okay. Now, when you're talking about leadership, another one is conflict. Tell me about a time when you had a conflict with another student or a disagreement with another person. That's also a kind of a question. Okay, perfect. So positive feedback, that came out nicely, that you kind of were bold to go to the patient and took a very good history. So that was a good feedback that you got from an attending. You can say, and even to today, I really practice good history taking with my patients. You can just end it that way. But negative feedback, I was not very sure why the attending, the nephrology attending gave you negative feedback because it was so busy. Yeah, but... we didn't have time and we we didn't interview the patient because, I mean, I guess... Oh, we're... okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was... I was oh, so basically, yeah, you were supposed to do that. And because you guys were got busy, you didn't get a time. Exactly. So because of the negative feedback, uh, I learned to better organize my time and to prioritize my work. So what was the learning point that has to come oh, out from, okay. from that? Mm -hmm. so, so that's okay. Then we went to the situations. I'm not sure if people are asking, but I do believe some programs are asking these situational questions because this is real life. So the, the UTI, the patient with the UTI whom you gave back to him, the one thing I really wanted you to do was to apologize. Really? Wow. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying apologize because you caused the problem or you made an error. I'm sorry that this was an unfortunate incident that happened with you. I looked at the chart and didn't see any allergies. And so Bactrim being the first line agent, I prescribed it to you. Um, I'm, I'm sorry this happened with you. And I'll make a note in the chart so that it doesn't happen again. That's it. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So I'm not saying I apologize because you made the mistake, but apologize what she went through. <laughs> and What happened to her? Yeah, just, you're right. It just helps reduce the anxiety. It just makes, makes the person feel okay. This person is listening to rather than, and the other part that you said, you should not be informing the other doctors about her allergy. We should be the ones maintaining the okay. record. So anytime you feel that, you're in the interview and you're asking, should I apologize or not? Just just go ahead and apologize. It, it's not going to harm you. I don't see any, mm -hmm. any, any points. Yeah, yet. you're right. You're right. Okay. Thank you. And then I asked you, what do you do outside medicine? So that came out nice workout movies. Um, some people will say what kind of last movie they saw or last book. That's what I was trying to ask you. What did you do? So, so you can certainly answer that. That's what I have for all the questions. Okay. okay I was wondering if the interviewer will ever stop me at one point and say, like, for example, when I, I am talking about myself, they would say like, okay, let's go on. It's kind of a little bit difficult for me to do that, but I've also been cutting people off if it's getting too lengthy. So yeah, don't feel bad about it. Just keep moving on to the next question, okay? Okay. That's why if you practice a little bit, like the tell me about yourself, because that's a lengthy answer. So at least if you practice for that, the rest are not too lengthy, really. And But yeah, they can cut you off. So, But don't take it personally. That's all I'm going to say. Okay, perfect. Where, what, what are you saying about something else? Okay. How are you going to talk about your step one score? Well, I haven't talk, think, talk, thought about that, but I was thinking like maybe it was just taking anxiety. I was going that way. Like maybe I had text taking anxiety and I felt like... What really happened? Let's start with that. Yeah. What do you think really happened? Okay. So in the last three blocks of the exam, I remembered I, a question for, from like the second block and I remembered I had put it wrong Got so it. I was a mess since that moment until the end of it, the exam I think that was what gave me that that low score yeah but okay. I, I tried to calm myself down and see if I could go on with the exam but in the score it showed that I didn't calm down okay 
So someone will ask you, okay, why is your step one score so below average? You can say, thank you uh, for bringing that up. You, you can say, while I prepared well for my step one, I really feel I was overcome by anxiety during the test as I was recalling all the wrong answers I had chosen in the earlier blocks. And I feel that's what affected my final score. But when I prepared for my step two CK, I took more time uh, to prepare and used more study resources. And uh, I'm glad that I scored 40 points higher, I guess. Like 30 you... something, 33, I guess. Okay, 33, 40 points higher. And did you pass step three or? No, not yet. And how about the OET or the step two CS? Oh, yeah, yeah. OET is good. And step two CS yeah. is good also. And another thing you can say, though I felt I prepared well for my step one, I became anxious when I was recalling the wrong answer choices I might have made in my test. But I, I'm glad I passed that exam on my first attempt because that's also important. Mm -hmm. And that I put in more time and became more confident when I took my step to CK and I scored 30 points higher and also passed my OET on my first attempt. Also, I've worked on my clinical skills and this is how I've strengthened my application for residency. So at least you did good. You made up for it the next time. Mm -hmm. Okay. So think about that. I think that'll come out very nicely then because you're presenting it very positively. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay. Okay, perfect. So I have a couple more questions. Okay. One of them is at the end when the interviewer asked me, like, do you have any questions for me? What questions should I ask? Or... Yeah. Right. There's a, there's a list I was going to put out, uh, but maybe I'll share it with you. I mean, bottom line is you can ask them anything. Um, I would highly suggest that you research the uh, program and ask questions like, I read on your website that there's a two-week research elective in the second year. Could you tell me more about, am I going to have a mentor in that? I saw on Twitter that the residents uh, have a gathering, do these outdoor gatherings. How else is the program helping with their well-being during residency? So it basically means that, okay, I've studied about your program and I'm asking you questions based on what I saw. So that gives you a, a nice uh, kind of a approach. I mean, people have asked all those questions, what changes do you anticipate and all? It's like, okay, everyone is asking that just for the sake of asking, but it's not very, it's not very helpful. Let me give you this, I'm going to give you this PDF. Thank you. Thank you for that. Another yeah. question I have, I have is, I mean, I, I guess you're not, you're not supposed to talk about the benefits of the program in, th in terms of like financial benefits and all of that, right? Is that right? The thing is, it's pretty standard across all residencies. So if you talk about salary, it's going to be very, very similar. So there's no point talking and uh, talking about it. Plus, the second thing is they will disclose all that information to you on the day of the interview. Even so, they discourage you from asking because one, they would have provided you that information. So you're basically wasting their time asking them again. Okay. And they'll give you all the information about the holidays and how many days off and all. So that's why it benefits. It's, it's pretty standard. So that's why it doesn't really help asking them, are, are you going to pay for my medical insurance and all this yeah, kind of yeah, right. yeah, it, but they, they, yeah, they'll tell all the benefits because they're also in a way trying to sell their program. Mm, okay. Like how, yeah, how, but stuff like you can ask, could you tell me more about how the program helps me find a position after residency? It's kind of a little bit open-ended because so they'll, they, they might say they can, they'll help. They might say they, they're not going to help. That'll be bad if they, they do that, but. Yeah. Oh, okay. Another question. I was reading some questions and one of them said like, the interviewer asks, teach me something. What am I supposed to answer to <laughs> Teach me something, anything. It could, it doesn't necessarily have to be about medicine. It could be just anything like your leadership experience. It could be about how to how to lead successfully. You can kind of reference that book from Michelle Obama and how you learned about leading others, delegating work to others, resolving conflicts. You can just talk about anything really. Or you could talk about your pet dog also if you wish. I don't <laughs> okay. know. 
you can yeah it's, it's very open-ended you can just talk about anything some people they'll talk about like financial like stocks and everything they'll talk about real estate you might talk about burnout how to resolve burnout learning new languages how to learn a new language i guess mm, okay okay <laughs> there's so many things you can talk about yeah. i was thinking maybe like something related to m making good coffee or something like that because Fine. i am from like a big coffee family so yeah just make sure the technical details and everything you'll know you, you might know it better just make sure you provide enough technical details so that they know okay yeah this is something she's really an expert on okay okay perfect thank you so much doctor yep. Most welcome, Dr. Juliana. So you're going to have this recording and Calendly is going to send you a, a link. It's like a Facebook link if you want to leave a review or just an anonymous link. If you if you want to just give feedback about this, uh, it'll help the other applicants too. Okay, perfect. Thank you so All much. Right. For Take care now. Yeah, most welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.